Hello and welcome to Chats Over Chai. I'm Lisa Singh, the CEO of the Australia India Institute. And Chats Over Chai is our new podcast series as part of our launch of India Matters, celebrating 75 years of India's independence in 2022. I want to acknowledge that I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people who have been custodians of this land for thousands of years and I acknowledge and pay respect to their elders, posts, past and present. Today, we are hosting our first Chats Over Chai podcast with Professor Rajesh Rajagopalan, who is an expert on international politics, and we will be unpacking the Quad in 2022 and what lies ahead for the Indo-Pacific. We all know that the Indo-Pacific region has very much taken centre stage in global politics. The region not only accounts for over 60% of the world's GDP and over 50% of global trade flow, but it is also a host of multiple flashpoints and potential sources of conflict. The recent elevation of the quadrilateral security dialogue and the commitments made by Quad countries in the region through various Quad dialogues and its various groupings, including the, the Quad Vaccine Expert Group, the, the Quad Climate Working Group, the Quad Critical and Emerging Technology Working Group, and the recently announced Quadrilateral Strategic Intelligence Forum, all reiterate the importance of, that these Quad countries place on the region. And now with the upcoming Quad meeting happening in Melbourne in mid-February, all eyes are on its members, Australia, India, Japan, and the United States, and their agendas for 2022, which will no doubt include maritime security, cybersecurity, and territorial threats. This upcoming meeting, the first Quad meeting for 2022 to be held between foreign ministers will take forward the commitments they made in 2021 and the crucial issues that have emerged since. So to unpack this, I am delighted to be joined with Professor Rajesh Rajagopalan. Ra Rajesh Rajagopalan is of course, Professor of International Politics at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. And his research and publications focus on international political theory and India's foreign and security policies. His work has been published in a number of academic and policy journals, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce and welcome you, Professor Rajesh Rajagopalan. Cool. Uh, thank you, I'm, I'm happy to be here, and thank you for the invitation to join uh, your podcast. Look, let's just dive straight in. Firstly, of course, the tw in 2021, we saw very much the elevation of the Quad when the leaders of the four Quad countries met in the United States at the invitation of President Biden and discussed the future of the grouping and announced very, a range of major areas of cooperation between them. But while that agenda is very broad and it includes defence cooperation, I think much of the discussion has focused very much on regional security concerns as opposed to collective security. So what do you see, uh, Professor, do you think, you know, what will increase in efforts to collectively tackle common security issues amongst Quad members? Thank you. Uh, I think uh, uh, whether we move on to look at uh, very specifically on security, uh, common security issues uh, remains to be seen, but that definitely is the direction that we are headed towards, uh, even though somewhat uh, slowly. It is, as you mentioned at the beginning, it's a quad security dialogue. Uh, it's there in the name itself. Um, but uh, one issue uh, is that uh, we are not fully discussing security. We are discussing, as you pointed out, a number of other issues that are of concern in the region. Um, uh, Quad has taken significant steps forward, but it is not at the stage yet of a deep security cooperation. Uh, obviously, uh, three of the members of the Quad are already uh, tied to each other with security treaties, the United States, Australia, and Japan. 
So the issue really is about India uh, and whether India will uh, involve itself in the same level of uh, security uh, cooperation um, uh, with, uh, with the other three. Uh, this issue is slightly difficult because uh, India is not yet comfortable with uh, deep security cooperation. I mean, India has traditionally been non-aligned. It hasn't engaged in security cooperation with other countries. And so there is a, there's a history there that, um, you know, that uh, makes it difficult for India to engage in that kind of security, uh, security cooperation. In fact, even in the last summit uh, uh, in Washington, uh, late 2020, uh, 2021, um, one of the background brief briefings by the Ministry of External Affairs uh, as a senior Indian official told the media that, well, we are not discussing security. We are, you know, we are discussing uh, other various other issues, including vaccines and infrastructure and environment and so on and so forth. So there is, I think, there is still a certain level of discomfort at, um, at deep levels of security cooperation. And by that, I mean, something that goes beyond uh, just doing military exercises, something that goes towards common planning, uh, common training, and so on. Um, that level of uh, deep level of security cooperation, I think, is still uh, a step uh, away uh, as far as India is concerned. But uh, definitely India has moved considerably in terms of moving towards some levels of security cooperation. India has signed some basic foundational agreements with the United States, for example, as well as with other countries. Um, and, you know, and so there is, the, the movement is in that direction towards uh, greater security cooperation, uh, towards common security uh, cooperation with Quad members. Uh, and of course, to some extent, this will also depend on China's behavior. I think um, part of the reason for the Indian movement towards greater security cooperation, which sort of goes against all of its traditional uh, approaches, uh, its traditional approach uh, in international relations, uh, is partly because of China's behavior. And so as uh, whether this uh, security cooperation depends to a large extent depends on India itself, uh, because the other countries are already in any case, uh, uh, have security cooperation, security, deep levels of security cooperation. Um, and so uh, China's behavior would to some, to a large extent dictate, I think, um, whether India would involve itself in that level of uh, deep uh, security cooperation. As of now, uh, that's the direction. And I think uh, to the extent that India moves in that direction, have uh, greater, uh, you know, deeper level security cooperation. Um, but uh, if China's behavior changes, then I suspect that um, uh, the Quad will still engage itself in other areas of cooperation, but maybe not uh, deep levels of security cooperation itself. But that we'll have to wait and see. Look, it's very interesting you raise this issue of, of India's, um, you know, it, it, it's sort of going against its traditional approaches in relation to security cooperation, its, its position of, of non-alignment, and, and the fact that it, you know, for all intensive purposes, there is definitely, um, you know, a, a perceived security uh, agenda for the Quad, even though we know it's, it's not a formal uh, alliance, uh, but exactly. it, it's still very much, uh, security is very much on the agenda. And I, I want to sort of take you in that sense, and particularly of what you raised in relation to China as well. Just at the moment, if we look at sort of at broadly, uh, you know, slightly beyond the Indo-Pacific in that sense to what experts have commented on in relation to this upcoming Quad meeting in Melbourne uh, that, you know, in, in relation to the current crisis in Ukraine. Now, th that crisis, I think, highlights, again, the importance of, uh, of the Indo-Pacific and the role of the Quad and what it can play in the region. But it also sort of, you know, on the backdrop of, of, of this particular Quad meeting, whether or not they will delve into looking at what is happening in Ukraine in relation to whether or not China could be perhaps looking at this sort of Russia-Ukraine situation as a sort of where what would I say blueprint for its own sort of uh, interests and play there with Taiwan. Do you do you see that as something that may be on the agenda for this particular Quad meeting? Is it something that would interest India? 
in, in terms of, uh, you know, it's sort of maritime security or at least it's, it's sort of uh, ongoing um, watch on, in relation to China's uh, security in the region? Yeah, I think uh, it is going to be discussed. I mean, I'm sure it will be discussed uh, behind closed doors. I doubt that they will have uh, that the Quad uh, countries will, uh, in their uh, common statement and so on, that they will uh, explicitly refer to it. I'm, uh, I'm not entirely sure that they will do that. But never, but that is definitely going to be on the minds and probably part of the discussion of uh, of the Quad countries. You know, uh, uh, what effect this will have? It is one aspect is in terms of whether China will uh, directly use that use that as a template. I mean, obviously, situations are different. Um, the Ukraine, Taiwan is a very different problem for China in the sense that you know the the, the military problem itself is far more uh, greater, far greater uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of conducting an amphibious operation and things like that, as compared to the sort of problems that China, that Russia faces, where it has a significant advantage and, and be able to surround Ukraine on three sides and so on. So the, I think the the exact template uh, is maybe difficult for Tai for China to uh, impose uh, on Taiwan, but uh, the possibility that uh, other possibilities of Russia becoming closer to China and uh, whether that would uh, they've already sort of calling each other everything but allies. I mean they're uh, obviously very closely aligned, even if they are not formal allies. And we saw in the UN Security Council that China stood by uh, Russia um, in the vote on on the issue. So I think that uh, that could definitely uh, uh, strengthen uh, to some extent China's um, uh, comfort in terms of uh, what, where it stands vis-a-vis vis -vis Taiwan. I think whether it would use that as a template might be more difficult to answer, but definitely uh, that would that would strengthen China's hand as it were. And I think that uh, as a consequence, that is something that would be, I'm sure would be discussed uh, at this at the coming meeting. But you know, um, I suspect that it will not be, it will not make it to the common the joint statement, but it will definitely be discussed. Mm. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot to play out in the, in this space that we'll have to watch, but uh, it will be interesting to see uh, what comes out of this this next quad meeting in relation to that. I think just just focusing again on China and um, uh, you know looking a bit more broadly beyond the security tensions uh, that that exist in the region. If we look at some of the sort of economic side or at least economic influence of China in the region, things such as the Belt and Road Project, the Australia, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. You know, China has really set some quite an ambitious plans for establishing regional and global economic influence. As a way of sort of countering China, uh, Professor, do you, do you see that the Quad could expand or at least broaden its agenda to include some sort of similar economic related initiatives, you know, perhaps a, a plan to increase or strengthen, um, you know, e economic ties or at least increase investment amongst the four quad countries? Yeah, I think we already see uh, the beginnings of it in the sense that um, there are efforts by all of the quad countries to increase uh, their investment uh, in infrastructure for other countries. Um, obviously, none of these countries, uh, none of the four quad members can actually match China's wealth and ambition, um, even though that itself might be re reaching its apogee as it were. Um, uh, we're already seeing some signs that China's overall investment in VR and so on might be coming down. But um, these, all of these countries, all the quad members do have different projects to provide investment um, individually to uh, to uh, to other countries, uh, both in the region as well as uh, in other places, including in Africa and the Middle East and so on. But uh, but one thing that uh, I think is needed or was needed uh, was greater coordination of these uh, of these efforts. I mean, you know, in, in the sense that we need to have it, it's no point uh, if we are working at cross purposes. So uh, even if not individually together, uh, there can be a synergy that uh, helps to match. 
um, China's efforts with BRI and uh, and other other sort of uh, uh, aid that it is giving to other countries or infrastructure that's giving to other countries. Uh, I think that that uh, the last summit meeting they did talk about coordination. They did set up a mechanism for coordination of these efforts. Um, of course, it's one thing to set something up, and it's another thing to make sure that it actually functions. And so I think. Uh, that remains to be seen as to how effectively the four countries can coordinate uh, their investment strategies and help uh, for other countries in terms of uh, infrastructural projects and other other projects. Um, uh, definitely, all all the four countries have uh, increased uh, and uh, improved their deliverables. I mean, definitely India has, um, and other countries have also done that. So that that is uh, that's a that's progress uh, in one sense. Even if uh, ultimately, even if all four countries together can't match China dollar for dollar, uh, that synergy is definitely um, uh, definitely something important. But also, I think the quad the quad countries have together managed also to raise awareness of the problem of um, of some of these uh, some of these investments that China is doing. Um, there is now, I think, widespread understanding. Uh, amongst countries that are receiving or are potentially going to receive um, China's infrastructure aid and uh, other help about the dangers that come with it. And I think that greater awareness itself is a significant achievement uh, for the Quad countries uh, because uh, it is not that China is able to, uh, the other countries are welcoming with open hand or open arms China's uh, efforts to uh, get involved in their economies and in their politics. Which ultimately happens, you know, economics then leads to politics, and so uh, there is a that that awareness itself uh, and wariness that come with that awareness about what China is doing. I think itself is a significant achievement for Quad countries because all of them have cooperated in, uh, in you know, together or individually uh, in raising that issue. And I think that itself that I think we sort of underestimate the effect of that also. I think in addition to the investment. Uh, and help that uh, the Quad countries can provide. It is also um, the 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 uh, the fact that these countries are now more careful about getting aid from China. I think that both of that help. Mm, yeah, very much so. And I think it's where you know it's where the sort of agenda of the Quad is really broadened out, particularly uh, you know in, in the economic sense, but also in relation to to the pandemic. And uh, I think this is where it's interesting if we look at sort of like the vaccine initiative, for example, um, you know, if you look at the Quad's sort of, um, you know, it's, it's history of how it was sort of formed out of that 2004 tsunami. It was very much sort of based on a sort of humanitarian response. And now to see these Quad countries play an important role in helping countries in the Indo-Pacific deal with the pandemic through this vaccination initiative, I think is, is very interesting. Of course, 2022 began, uh, Professor, with the third uh, COVID uh, wave in almost every country in the region now, I think. And while we're much better prepared than we were two years ago, uh, back when the pandemic struck, now that there is a vaccine, there is still obviously a lot of uncertainty around the pandemic as it lingers on. So do you think that the Quad has done enough in, in this respect? Do you think more could or should be done by the member countries to help the Indo-Pacific region deal better with this? I mean, there's still a lot of countries in our Indo-Pacific region whose populations are, are still not vaccinated. Yeah, I think, um, uh... Quad countries have one of the problems. I think, obviously, with the pandemic, is that um, this is so unprecedented um, um, uh, that it's not very clear how countries can cooperate in dealing with it. I mean, so to some extent, what we have seen globally are countries uh, essentially doing um, national efforts uh, rather than cooperative efforts. I mean, it's not a multilateral sort of effort that. We have seen we have seen essentially uh, individual national efforts uh, both in their own countries as well as to some extent in terms of the help they provide to others. Uh, but uh, now that, as you correctly pointed out, obviously the two years of experience, 
Um, uh, and the fact that in a number of these countries, especially the US, uh, uh, Japan, India, all of these countries have to some extent gotten control over the situation. That initial panic uh, has subsided. And so I think there is a greater uh, both willingness, but also uh, capacity to help uh, in a coordinated manner countries and regions which have not been able, which you know, haven't received uh, the same level of uh, vaccinations and which may not have the capacity to uh, produce for themselves or to or to buy these uh, vaccines. So I think, yeah, I think the the the, the fact that uh, quad countries are now doing that, I mean, doing that sort of jointly, uh, I'm not still sure that they are fully there in terms of doing it jointly. It's still, but even if they, even as, as with the economic effort, uh, the infrastructure effort, even if they can coordinate their efforts, uh, especially in terms of the fact that, you know, India can produce a lot, um, in terms of vaccines, uh, other necessities can come from other countries. So that coordination itself might be uh, might be significant, might make a significant difference to uh, parts of the world. And of course, that also helps uh, not just the Quad, but also not just Indo-Pacific, but also other parts of the world. And, and ultimately, to some extent, the challenge that China um, represents is not just a military challenge. It's also a political challenge. It's also an economic challenge. It's you know it's a, it's a, it's a, a multifaceted challenge. And so uh, being able to deal with that, uh, to have these other areas, um, in addition to security, uh, where quad countries can cooperate and coordinate, um, I think is uh, absolutely essential. And so um, I think there is a. It's still not. It's still difficult because we are still not entirely over the pandemic, obviously. And so, um, but the fact that they're coordinating and that they've at least expressed a strong desire to coordinate, um, setting up working groups and so on, uh, I think that is all in the right direction. Um, I think so. Uh, I think I uh, over the coming year, I expect that this will become a bit more solid and and a bit more, um, uh, bit more uh, there'll be more progress uh, in that kind of cooperation helping others. Mm. Mm. And India is certainly playing such a leading role in uh, the manufacturing of, of vaccines uh, for those quad countries and to, to spread out through the region, so important. I think you, you, you raise the issue of the multifaceted nature of the, of the growing Chinese threat in that sense. And obviously, while the quad is, is positioned to deal with this, it certainly distances itself from actually even naming uh, China in any of its declarations or statements. Do you, do you see that changing? I mean, I think, you know, you know, will the Quad sort of openly acknowledge that, you know, that this multifaceted nature of China as, as a threat to its interests, to the region, and make its intentions perhaps a bit more clear in terms of you know, its role as, a, as four countries functioning as a sort of counterweight, counterweight really, to, to China's assertiveness in the region? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we have not referred to China specifically, but I don't think there is any doubt in anybody's mind as to <laughs> what the Quad is about. And, you know, uh, 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 all the issues that we talk about, specifically the, the code words that we use in the declarations about uh, free and open and, you know, um, and non-coercive practices, all of that very clearly are referring to China. And I think China is not in any doubt about that either, because obviously you see every time, uh, repeatedly, uh, over and over again, China talking about small clicks and close clicks. And, uh, you know, so clearly they are aware of what a quad is. I mean, um, I suppose at some stage it will, it might, uh, uh, we might be more open about actually naming China. Um, I am not certain that that is um, that is necessarily that important, uh, but it also, to some extent, will depend on China's behavior again. Uh, because um, if China's uh, aggressiveness um, increases, uh, so if, if they do something on Taiwan, for example, or if there is a full-scale war across the Himalayas, things like that, I think um, some of these uh, reticence uh, will change. Um, you you do see. Uh, far greater willingness uh, to specifically talk about, not even if it's not naming China, but specifically talk about China's actions, even if it's in a roundabout way. And I think even the fact that we are talking about these issues 
um, I, you know, that has changed over the last several years um, uh, in, in terms of the cooperation in dealing with these specific issues. Earlier, it was on individual issues such as the, you know, uh, South China Sea or uh, one thing or the other, but it's now, you see the same phraseology used repeatedly in, uh, in statements and so on. And so I think there is no doubt about about what uh, who is being uh, referred to. Uh, but uh, specifically mentioning China uh, itself, I think that will happen if Chinese be, you know, in, a, in one sense, one could say that the Quad is something like a deterrence uh, effort, right? You know, it's sort of basically mm -hmm. telling China that, you know, um, we recognize what you're doing and we are not, you know, we are not very happy about it and we are sort of, we, 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 we can cooperate to sort of counter it. If they, if that effort doesn't succeed and if China continues down the same path, becomes even more aggressive, becomes even more uncaring of others' uh, interests and other security, then I think uh, the next step will be naming uh, China itself. But I think to some extent, it gives China the opportunity to back off and to, you know, to be more careful in its behavior. So far, they haven't taken the hint, uh, clearly, mm -hmm. um, but um, one can hope, it, it, it's always better not to sort of go down that path of fairly you know, open sort of conflict, uh, but uh, it ultimately depends on China because this group came together precisely because of China's behavior. Mm -hmm. And it ultimately is uh, up to China to decide whether uh, this is the path that it, that it wants to uh, you know, travel down on. And if it decides that it wants to go down that path, then I think China will be named uh, eventually. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right. As a, as a mini lateral sort of grouping, um, you know, there's no doubt that, that there's a, a clear sort of understanding of, of that sort of threat in the region. But, you know, through diplomatic means, uh, yes, it'd be interesting to see if, if that sort of level of diplomacy of, of the unnaming um, yeah. of that particular country changes. Obviously, uh, in, the, in the past uh, uh, six months or, or so, there's been a, another sort of interplay happen uh, in relation to, to security, particularly maritime security. And uh, I want, I'm referring to AUKUS, of course, Professor, and uh, I know that, you know, experts in India have differing views when it comes to, to AUKUS and, you know, and the impact that it will have, particularly on the Quad countries and, and India's role in the region. And according to you, what, what does AUKUS mean for India and and in terms of its role in the Indo-Pacific? I think there is some concern. Uh, there are some Indian analysts who have seen uh, the AUKUS as potentially undermining the Quad and reducing India's importance within the Quad because obviously uh, it includes, uh, uh, you know, Australia and the US in a separate um, uh, security arrangement with the with, with UK. But um, I think as far as uh, I, I do see the AUKUS as essentially strengthening the Quad because um, the purpose of the Quad is providing a balance uh, in the region to ensure that uh, uh, there, is a, there is a level playing field, uh, to ensure that uh, uh, smaller countries are not coerced and so on. So that is not going to be possible with a single country or with one or two countries working together. I mean, so as many countries as are willing to sign up to that effort, um, I think it's better for uh, better for uh, uh, better for the Quad and better for all the Quad countries and better for India. I mean, India obviously is the reason India is in the Quad, despite some initial reluctance, um, is because uh, India recognizes that it cannot manage this multifaceted challenge on its own. It, it does need others to others to join it. And of course, the Quad. Uh, uh, the, we have had a number of different uh, minilaterals that included one or two Quad countries with uh, non-Quad countries. Um, and so it is one more in that direction. Even though, of course, AUKUS is a much more deeper security cooperation than some of these other minilaterals. But nevertheless. Uh, as many um, shoulders as can be put to this effort, obviously, the better. So I do not see this as a problem for the Quad or for the Quad countries. I think even for India, I think it is a good thing. There is, of course, one um, one point that 
does need to be kept in mind from New Delhi's perspective, which is that, um, or at least my perspective, um, which is that if India uh, continues to remain reluctant to engage in this deeper security cooperation that I was talking about earlier, then other countries are going to find their own ways of doing that. And so um, I think for India's own interests, uh, it might not be uh, fair, it might not be sort of, you know, it, had, it might not be helpful for India to stay away from deeper security cooperation within the Quad and within uh, other sort of forms like that, because you don't, uh, India does, should not want to be left out of these uh, deeper security cooperation uh, that many of these um, groupings and uh, uh, arrangements um, indicate. So I think in that sense, uh, India needs to be slightly concerned, but uh, to, you know, it's sort of, it balances, uh, it, it's a balance in the sense that India also does welcome other countries. And I think even officially, India hasn't had anything to say critical of AUKUS. Um, or you know the U or the Australia Japan arrangement for that matter uh, mm. recent uh, uh, treaty great. that uh, Japan and Australia that uh, had so I mean earlier again to sort of refer back to the traditional Indian policy has been very against these kinds of arrangements especially when it comes to India's own region India Indo Pacific uh, mm. Asia and so on uh, but uh, India has done nothing of that sort and so I think there is a recognition that these things are all good I mean as many countries as, as are involved in this effort, it's better for India. Mm, mm, no doubt it does challenge that, that long held position of India of non-alignment. Um, yeah, as we go forward and see whether it does need in, indeed, as you say, to deepen its security, security cooperation. It, just on that, I think this is some, an area where both Australia and India uh, have a lot of interest is in the critical and emerging technologies space, uh, particularly, you know, with the low emissions technology partnership. And now, of course, Australia uh, establishing uh, a centre of excellence for critical and emergency technology in India. At the same time as, the, as all of that is going on, you've got this sort of increasing reliance of some ASEAN countries on China when it comes to their their import of critical and emerging technology. So do you see any opportunity in this space that, that the Quad countries should be working on in, in 2022? Yeah, I think this is, uh, uh, there was obviously a lot of focus on this um, at the last summit. And I, and I expect that this will continue to be uh, a major area of uh, focus for the Quad countries, especially because um, this is one of the things that, uh, in addition to uh, aggressive behavior in South China Sea and so on, um, this is one of the things that brought the Quad countries together, the 5G mm -hmm. issue and China's yeah. coercion on the 5G, uh, on 5G with, uh, you know, with, regard with various countries. And so I think this, is, this, is, uh, uh, this will there, therefore remain at the forefront. And also the fact that China's progress uh, in a number of these areas, in AI, for example, or China's uh, advances in uh, cyberspace as well as in outer space, and um, the potential areas of uh, threat that happens as a consequence of this, and all of the all of the Quad countries have uh, borne the brunt of some of these attacks and some of these uh, threats that um, come from these kinds of uh, Chinese uh, technologies as well as. Uh, China's actual use of some of these technologies, and so, uh, and of course, the potential for future uh, future threats, uh, everything from ASATs to, uh, you know, cyber attacks and so on. Uh, and AI remains the background, obviously. Uh, so I think that is uh, one area where again there can be uh, significant cooperation. This the one um, problem here, obviously, is that uh, technology, high technology, especially, is something that states very jealously guard and um, uh, states do not find it very easy to cooperate when it comes to areas such as this. But the fact that uh, Quad countries are uh, discussing this uh, so openly and um, uh, with in some, such depth, uh, including in terms of setting up working groups and looking closely at that, uh, at these issues, I think is uh, very important. I mean, you know, um, uh, areas um, like semiconductors and so on, are going to be vital um, in terms of moving forward. So there is going to be, uh, I think this is uh, going to be an area of focus for 
uh, another area of focus for uh, for the Quad countries in terms of managing this. I mean, and uh, and all of these countries do have their their uh, uh, their focus uh, areas where they can uh, contribute. Uh, it's not that. Um, you know, uh, that only some countries can even contribute. All of these countries can contribute in this area. And therefore, that also leads to uh, a certain, um, a greater synergy uh, when it comes to coll collaborating and cooperating on this area. So I think I think that is important, but also the, is, as with vaccines and as with other uh, infrastructure and so on and so forth, um, technology and uh, the dangers that come with China's um, technological prowess uh, is also something that the Quad countries have highlighted. And that also is something that the, on which there has been a significant amount of progress because there is now recognition that there are dangers that come with it. Um, and, and that, uh, I, I, again, um, a lot of this has to do with how uh, to make others aware of the problems. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, some countries, uh, we still can't match China's uh, even together. It's, I think it's difficult to match China's um, manufacturing capacity and its uh, even its technological advances um, in some of these areas. Uh, but uh, that recognition, I think, is important. And mm. moving forward, I think you will have uh, more cooperation in this area. Mm. And hence that greater focus on it by, exactly. by the quad yeah. countries, as you say, all of them. Uh, have have a reason to have that focus uh, on critical and emerging technologies. Um, I, look, there's a number of other working groups. That, obviously, the climate working group is, is an incredibly important one, and we saw, uh, you know, some of the individual countries that make up the Quad uh, take a leading role at the COP26 meeting uh, on climate, including India, uh, in that space. A number, you know, the, there's a lot going on in terms of those working groups uh, and the like. But do you see that uh, any any members uh, of the Quad uh, are placing more importance on some of these areas that the working groups are focused on than others? Uh, you know, for India, for example, is there a particular focus out of out of these Quad uh, working groups, expert groups that that it's more interested in? Uh, I'm not sure that uh, I mean I think uh, the one area where that you that we just talked about uh, is a critical and emerging technologies that is common for all uh, all of the countries. I think that is probably the single most important uh, area within these working groups uh, or technology and so on. I think that is going to be a critical area uh, that um, for all countries because uh, we are uh, uh, individually and as a group falling behind uh, on some of these areas. And that is something that is potentially dangerous for all countries. I think so that, that is one area where I think where, which is probably the most important and where they can cooperate. Climate is, um, there are difficulties obviously, but uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, but they, that is again an area where greater dialogue can help, uh, but there are obviously differing uh, perspectives and differing interests when it comes to those sorts of issues. But Definitely on technology and emerging, especially emerging technologies, um, and as I mentioned, space as well as cyber semiconductors are becoming you know, more and more uh, critical uh, as an area where um, India has made a number of initiatives, uh, changed this tax laws and so on and so forth to to encourage a huge amounts of investment that is going into uh, setting up uh, its own semiconductor industry in in India, um, or especially over the last couple of months, there's been a lot of movement on that uh, in Delhi. So I think that that uh, probably is the most important of all of these uh, various areas uh, of this world, of these different world, I would say. Mm, absolutely. Well, we'll see the focus next uh, in, in the upcoming quad meeting in Melbourne uh, on some of those areas. But look, uh, just one last question, uh, Professor, uh, before we wrap up this podcast. And look, this may be a bit premature to ask, but there has been some talk about a quad plus grouping. Um, so if, if we are going to look at a sort of quad plus into the future, potentially at least, which countries do you think might be best suited in this sort of quad plus format? 
uh, that is a difficult question to answer because <laughs> we have talked about a number of different countries which are potential members for Quad Plus. I mean, we've had these dialogues with uh, New Zealand and uh, South Korea and Vietnam and so on. So uh, the difficulty is that, of course, they have to be interested, most importantly. Right? I mean, in terms of uh, who probably has the most interest uh, in becoming a member of Quad, uh, at least in terms of their conditions that they face, uh, one would think it's Vietnam that is probably the closest, uh, uh, which you know directly is in the path, as it were, of Chinese power has ongoing disputes with China and so on, um, ongoing territorial disputes with China and the South China Sea and so on. So uh, that is most, I suspect that is probably the most likely or the, probably the most interested, but we don't know. I mean, at, at this stage, I think uh, a number of countries have sort of uh, um, express that interest but it also uh, it also remains to be seen as to whether how well they would fit within the some of the other aspects some of the let's say the uh, strategic cultural aspects of uh, of the quad um, as it were and so um, I think that is it's also one has to be a bit careful I think about expanding this group uh, too far because the larger the number of countries, the greater the coordination problems. And so, uh, as it is, even within the Quad, um, there are there is obviously some difference in terms of uh, what should what we should focus on because obviously India's um, India's primary threat comes from uh, on the on the Himalayas on the continental side. Uh, the, the naval, the maritime part is important, but uh, the immediate one is on the on the continental side, and so um, uh, that does uh, increase the complexity because uh, are, all of these countries are in different situations, different geographical locales, and um, uh, the the threats they face are somewhat slightly different, and so uh, we don't want to necessarily, uh, I think, uh, increase it to too quickly uh, uh, in order to avoid those kinds of coordination problems. But nevertheless, I think it is possible to call uh, the Quad as a group to co to coordinate and co and cooperate with a number of these countries. I think I think that is uh, obviously there are common issues uh, with a number of Southeast Asian countries, even beyond uh, uh, Vietnam, um, that uh, Indonesia, for example. Uh, so there are a number of countries with which uh, which there are uh, issues that uh, Kulapot can discuss and coordinate, uh, possibly. As for membership itself, I think it probably had to wait for a bit longer. Mm. Well, the, the, the strength of the membership is to the leadership level has happened over such a short period. Uh, yeah. If you look at last year uh, on a, in itself. So there are a lot of moving parts going on in, in this space. And um, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see uh, the next quad meeting in Melbourne. Uh, Professor Rajesh Rajakopalan, thank you so much for joining me for our first Chats Over Chai podcast. You've been listening. Thank you. Thank you. You've been thank you so much. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Australia India Institute's Chats Over Chai podcast with Professor Rajesh Rajakopalan from JNU University an expert on international politics, and we have been unpacking the Quad in 2022 and what lies ahead for the Indo-Pacific. Uh, subscribe to our podcast, uh, Australia India Institute, Chats Over Chai, for future podcasts in 2022. And thank you for joining us.